the first thing we'll need to change is we'll need to actually pass in the map to our update function. So let's say map map as the second parameter update requires. This will let us easily pass around the map and all of the walls inside of our level to all of the game objects in our game. This will let us easily check for collisions with all of the objects in our game and with all of the walls in our game. Because we changed this virtual function to now include map, we will also need to go back to player.cs and change the update function here because this is overriding that function. Here where it says base.update, we'll pass in map. And then finally, back in our game1.cs update, I believe, we have this update objects function. And here we need to pass in map as well. So now all of our objects have access to the map to check for collisions. We could go inside of our player.cs and do a check there to see if we're colliding with any of the walls. But remember earlier I talked about making a character class that does various things. I mentioned it having a physics equation that lets us have a uh, acceleration and deacceleration so we slowly move up to speed and it feels more natural that way. I'd like to actually go ahead and make that character class because if you think about it, all characters will need to check for a wall collision. So if we just put that in the player class later on when we added more things to our game, we would have to copy and paste that functionality over and over and over and that's not cool. And we would also probably have to copy and paste the physics stuff I was talking about earlier because I imagine most characters in our game will want that acceleration deacceleration equation. So let's just go ahead and right click game engine and go to add class then here we'll say character hit add as always we need to copy over the using statements from one of our other classes and paste them here I will also make the class public because we want everyone to have access to character and since all characters are game objects, we will derive from the game object class. Let's set up some variables here. Let's make a variable called public vector2 velocity. And this will be how fast we're currently moving in the x direction and in the y direction. So when we first start to accelerate, the velocity would be pretty low. But as we're going up and hit full speed, the velocity would be at a higher value. Next, let's make some variables to customize the feel of our movement. <laughs> Oops, feel, not fell. <laughs> we'll make these variables a protected float. First, let's make the D cell. I'm going to set that at 1.2F. The lower your D cell is, the slower you slow down. So if your decel is very high and you let off of the button that you're moving with, you would immediately come to a halt. But if your decel is low, like 0.1, you would let off of the key and your player would still move a little bit to come to a halt. So depending on what type of game you're making, you would set this value to be different. I imagine if you're making a race car game or something like that, you would have a completely different D cell than if you're making a platformer game or a Pong clone like we're going to do later. Next we'll make a protected float called a cell. I'm going to set this to 0.78F and remember that the lower your acceleration is the slower you take off. So if you had a low acceleration defined here and you press down the input, it would take a long time before you got up to full speed. If your Excel was high here, as soon as you press the button, you would immediately be at full speed. So again, you would come back later when you're working on your game and customize these to feel like you want them to feel. Finally, let's make protected float max speed. I'm going to set this at 5F and this is the maximum speed we're allowed to go. So the character will never go faster than 5F. I'm going to make a couple new lines. 
Here we'll make a couple of const variables. The first one will be called gravity, and I'm going to set that to 1F. If we're making a platformer game, we would constantly want to apply gravity to the player so we can bring him back down to Earth. Depending on what type of game we make, maybe we want gravity, maybe not, we're going to program this where you can flip a bull on and off to have gravity work or not work, and you'll find that useful, I think, in the future if you're making different types of games and want to reuse this code. The next const will be a float called jump velocity. I'm going to set that to 16F. And this will be how much we jump if we are able to jump in this game. So for platformers, if we jump, that's how much we would jump up in the air. Finally, we'll make one called max fall velocity. I'm going to set that to 32. And in a platformer, if you fall down and the gravity starts moving you down, it's possible you can start falling at really insane speeds depending on how long the fall is. So we'll just cap this at 32 and say you can never fall more than 32 F per frame. Down here, we'll make a protected bull called jumping, and that will be true if our character is currently jumping in the air. Finally, we'll make a public static bull called apply gravity. For now, we'll set that to false. Static basically means that it's always in memory, no matter if there's a character active or not. So this lets us easily access this bool from anywhere inside of our code. And you'll see that later on, how easy it is to access this. So whenever we flick on apply gravity to true, we will update our physics to apply gravity. But whenever this is false, we will not apply gravity. Down here, let's make a function called public override initialize. This just overrides the initialize function from game object. We're going to initialize velocity at vector 2.0. So whenever we call initialize, we won't be moving at all. And we will also set jumping to be false. Because usually you don't start off a character jumping in the middle of air. Next, we'll make an override for update. Below the update function, I'd like to define a new function called protected virtual bool. So we will return true or false. Check collisions. It will take in a map. It will take in a list of game objects. And it will also take in a bool called x-axis. The x-axis bool will be set to true if we want to check for collisions on the x-axis, and it will be false if we want to check for collisions on the y-axis. We'll need to call this function two different times for each axis to successfully detect for collisions. This function will look for collisions with all the other objects in our game and with all the walls stored in our map. The first thing we'll want to do is create a variable called rectangle future bounding box. We're going to basically calculate where our bounding box will be on the next frame. Then we will take that future bounding box and see if we're about to collide with anything. If we detect that there will be a collision on the next frame, we will stop our movement in this direction. That way, we don't get stuck inside of a wall, because if we keep going and only stop the player once we're actually inside of a bounding box, he'll get stuck in there. And that's not good, so we want to be looking one step ahead for the collisions. Let's start off by just setting this future bounding box to our current bounding box right now, currently. And then below here, we can add on to our future bounding box depending on what direction we're checking for. So let's start off by saying int max x equals int max speed, and then int max y equals int max speed. If we are applying gravity and are able to jump, we will set our max y to our jump velocity. 
This way we have the max speed for both the X and Y. Like I said, sometimes if we're in a game where we can jump, the max Y would be more than just the max speed, so we set that appropriately here. Now we can actually add on to the future bounding box, since we know what our max speeds are. We'll say if X axis is true and velocity.x is not equal to zero. So if we're currently checking the x-axis for collisions and we are moving on the x-axis, because if we're not moving on the x-axis, why check for it, right? So if both of those things are true, we'll go in here and say if velocity.x is greater than zero, future bounding box dot x plus equals max x. So if we're moving to the right, we'll just add on the maximum velocity we can ever move in the right direction. All right? Else, if we're moving to the left, we would subtract max x from the future bounding box x position. So there's different ways to detect for collision, but I prefer to just use the maximum velocity available. So even if we're moving just a little bit to the right, we're still going to add the maximum velocity in that direction. Depending on the type of game that you're making, this collision detection might not work, but I find it's kind of simple to code and it works in most cases. So that's why we're using it. Else, if x axis equals false, we are currently checking the y direction, so we will also want to see that velocity y is not equal to zero. Similar as up here, we can copy and paste this. If velocity dot y is greater than zero, we will add on max y to the y position. Else we will subtract max y from the y position. So now we've added on to our future bounding box based on the direction we're headed. So this should be a decently accurate estimate of where our bounding box will be in the next frame. Down here we will make a new rectangle called wall collision and we will set this to map dot check collision passing in our future bounding box. So we'll pass in the future bounding box into the map and the map will take that bounding box and test it against every single wall inside of our level. If wall collision is not equal to rectangle dot empty, that means we've collided with a wall. So we'll do curly bracket. And here we need to take care of two different cases. If our game is not using gravity, we can easily just return true because we've detected a collision with a wall. However, if our game is using gravity, we need to have another check here that locks the feet of the player to the ground if we're falling down and we land on a floor. Because in platformers, you're jumping on top of walls that are also floors, right? So we need to lock the player's feet when they land on the ground. And walls will be used to represent our ground as well, so we need to do some additional checks on the y-axis to make sure we're handling this case correctly. So let's start with that case first. I'm going to say if apply gravity equals true and our velocity dot y is greater or equal than gravity because if our velocity on the y-axis is greater than gravity we know that we are falling down or jumping. We're having some type of movement here on the y-axis and parentheses our future bounding box dot bottom is greater than wall collision dot top minus max speed and outside of that parentheses we'll do another parentheses case here and future bounding box dot bottom is less than or equal to wall collision 
dot top plus velocity dot y. If that is true, we will return true. And also we'll do another function here that takes care of our landing. We'll fill that out in a second. But first let's explain uh, let's explain what's going on here in this code. So basically, I'm going to bring up MS Paint here and have a little illustration. So basically, there is a wall right here that represents our ground. And we have a person right here, a character, who is falling to land on the ground. The way we have coded this is this red line right here, whenever the character lands anywhere in this red area, we will lock the feet of the character to the very top of this floor. Because it's possible if we're moving really fast that he, his feet will land inside of the floor right in here and then we have to move him up really fast and then the character will look glitchy because he's moving real jerkily, right? We want to take care of this very smoothly so if he's pretty close to hitting the floor in this little area right here, we'll just go ahead and count that as a collision and lock his feet to the ground. Okay? So, with that visual in mind, let's look at the code. If our future bounding box dot bottom is greater than wall collision dot top minus max speed, so wall collision dot top is the very top of the wall, that would be the top of the ground. Bounding box dot bottom is the very bottom of the character's bounding box, so that's where his or her feet is. If the feet are in the wall, or if his or her feet is greater than the top of this wall minus max speed, so remember that red line I showed earlier, it was a little above the top of the wall. We're getting that from this right here. We're subtracting the max speed we can go to give us that little safe area. And the future bounding box dot bottom is less than or equal than the top of the wall collision plus the y velocity. If all of this is true, we will count this as a true collision and then land the character on top of the floor. So we'll lock his feet to the top, okay? Hopefully the visual helps you make sense of this. You won't ever have to touch this again, so don't worry about it too much, but that is what it's doing. Let's go ahead and outside of this if statement, we'll say else return true. So if apply gravity is false and we're not checking for this extra case, we'll just return true because we detected a collision. Now that we've checked for wall collisions, we'll need to check for object collisions. And this will be pretty simple. We just need to iterate through all the objects in our engine and if the game object is collidable, if it's something we want to collide with and stop the character from moving through it, if we detect a collision between the two bounding boxes of the characters, we'll just return true from this function. But if you remember, we made a check collisions function for the map right here, but we never made a check collision function for game objects. So let's go ahead and make that really fast. It's super simple. Back in gameobject.cs, underneath the update function, I'm going to make a public virtual bool called check collision. We'll pass in an input rectangle that we'll test with our own rectangle. And here we'll just return bounding box dot intersects, passing in the input rectangle. So this will either return true or false, depending on if the rectangle we passed in intersects with the rectangle we have in this game object. So let's go back to character.cs, and now we can use this function by iterating through all of the game objects in the engine. So for as long as i is less than objects.count, i++. Here we'll say if objects i is not equal to this it's important that we make sure we're not looking at the object we are because if we check collisions against ourself it'll always return true right if we're checking our own bounding box against our own bounding box 
it'll always detect a collision. So if the object we're looking at is not us, the object we're currently in, and the object we're looking at is active, and the object we're looking at is collidable, if all these things are true, we can go ahead and check for collisions with this object. So if objects I dot check collision with our future bounding box equals true, we will return true from this function. If we return true from this function, that will stop us from moving. And finally, if we've ran all of these tests, if we've checked for collisions against all of the walls in our game and checked for collisions against all of the objects in our game, and we've come to the very last part of this function, that means there are no collisions detected, so we will return false. So this function is almost done. The last thing we need to do is take care of our land response here that we talked about earlier. I'm going to make a helper function for this. So underneath the check collisions function here, I'm going to make a function called public void land response. And I will pass in the rectangle of the wall we've collided with. So like I said, we're going to lock the feet of the character to the top of the wall. So to lock the feet, we will want to set the Y position of this character. We'll say position.y equals wall collision dot top. This would be the top of the ground we've landed on. And we need to subtract the top from how tall this character is, okay? So we'll say bounding box height, because that's how tall our bounding box is, plus the offset that we're drawing the bounding box at. So this should perfectly set the Y position of our character to be right on top of the ground. Next we'll say velocity.y equals zero because we're standing on ground now, so we shouldn't be moving. And finally, here we'll say jumping equals false because we've landed. There's no way that we could be jumping at this moment. Now we just need to go back here and call this function. We'll say land response and pass in the wall collision that we've calculated. And this should now be complete. So there's a few more things we need to do here. I've been talking a lot about applying gravity. I've been saying if the gravity takes the player down, this will happen, so on and so forth. Well, we're not actually applying the gravity to anything yet, so we need to take care of that. Um, but before we jump in and make the apply gravity function, I'd like to copy over a few helper functions that I provided in the Michael Hicks toolbox. So let's go there. And inside the code folder, there's a functions folder. And we're going to take the on ground function, control A, control C, and then underneath land response, we'll paste that. Basically this is just a helper function to return the rectangle of the ground we're currently standing on. It doesn't do anything too crazy, it calculates a future bounding box and uses the velocity.y and gravity to calculate where we will be on the y-axis in the next frame like we've done before, and then it just returns the collision on the map of the wall the future bounding box has collided with. Nothing crazy, we've already done it. I just wanted to give you that so we didn't have to retype it. And then back in the toolbox, I want this 10 to 0 function. We'll control C. And then underneath here, we'll control V or above, whatever, it doesn't matter. And this function here takes in values and basically gradually moves them towards zero. So we'll be using this in our movement function later on. But first let's take care of that apply gravity function. We'll be using the on ground helper function for our gravity calculations up top. Right above the check collisions function, I'm going to make a new function called private void apply gravity. We'll pass in the map of our level. If jumping is true, so if we're currently jumping in the air, or 
if our feet are not currently on the ground. On ground, we'll return an empty rectangle. So for jumping up in the air or falling down to the ground, if one of those things is true, we will say velocity.y plus equals gravity. This is very basic. We're just applying gravity to our velocity. Gravity slowly brings us down, right? That's the whole purpose of gravity. It's bringing us down to Earth. So that's what that's doing. Pretty straightforward. The other thing we'll check for here is we'll say if velocity.y is greater than max fall velocity, velocity.y equals max fall velocity. So if we're falling a super long distance, <laughs> gravity will keep on pulling us down really fast. Eventually we can be falling so fast that we're moving like 200 pixels per frame. <laughs> it gets really crazy, okay? And when that happens, you start skipping through walls. So when we do this, we're just limiting how fast we can fall down. I believe we set that at 32 pixels per frame. Now that we've made our apply gravity function, we can actually use this. Let's go up, up here and make the most important function in this class. This is where all the functions we've wrote will come together. This function is called update movement. It will take in everything update does. So let's just copy and paste. It takes in the objects list and the map, curly brackets. So first things first, we want to move in this function, right? We want to move on the x-axis, move on the y-axis. But before we apply the velocity to our position, we need to check for collisions to make sure we're not going to get stuck in any wall or collidable object. So this is pretty simple. We'll just say if velocity.x is not equal to 0, so if we're moving in the x direction, and check collisions. Make sure it's check collisions with an S at the end of it. Passing in map, objects, and true for the x-axis because we're currently checking the x direction. If check collisions returns true, that means we've detected a collision. So we want to set our velocity.x to zero. So let's say in theory we're moving 20 pixels per frame in the x-axis. We're moving to the right, let's say. We've detected a collision in the future, so check collisions returns true. We'll just immediately set our velocity to zero so we stop dead in our tracks on the x-axis. After we've done this check, we can say position.x plus equals velocity.x. So if we pass this test and velocity was not set to zero, this is where position.x will get moved. Our velocity.x will be applied to our position. And then basically we'll just copy and paste this and do the same exact thing for the y-axis. So if velocity.y is not equal to zero, and we'll pass in false here for the x-axis bool. If all of that returns true, velocity.y equals zero. And then down here we'll apply the velocity.y to the position.y. Cool. So now we've taken care of applying our velocity to our position. We also need to apply gravity. So if apply gravity equals true, we will call apply gravity, passing in map. And then finally, remember the 10 to 0 function we copied over earlier? We need to be gradually moving our velocities towards 0. All right? So this is what will decelerate our velocity as soon as we let go of the key. If we don't take care of lowering the velocity to 0, our velocity will always be set to max velocity and we'll just keep on moving even if we don't have a button pressed down on the keyboard. All right? So this is just taking care of our velocities to make sure they're constantly trying to move towards zero if nothing is being added to the velocity. All right? So let's say velocity.x equals 10 to zero. Velocity.x is the value and we will pass in decel for the amount we want to move towards zero with, okay? For the velocity.y, depending on if we're applying gravity or not, we would do the same thing. We would be slowly moving the velocity.y towards zero. So if we're not applying gravity, we can just copy and paste this and say velocity.y equals 10 to zero 
velocity dot y and d cell. So if we are applying gravity, we don't really want to move velocity towards zero, right? Because gravity is moving us down constantly towards the Earth. So the behavior is a little bit different. But like I said, we, you won't have to worry about this ever again. If your game is using gravity, you can flick this bull up here to be true or false depending on the scenario for your game and everything else will just work appropriately thanks to how we've coded this, okay? Now we need to call this function up in update. So right before we call base.update, we'll say update movement, passing in objects and map. So remember just a second ago I said we are moving the velocity of the x and y axis slowly towards zero. So if we're no longer adding to the velocity, this will eventually be zero. But where are we actually adding to the velocity? Spoiler alert, we're not. <laughs> okay, We're not doing anything with the velocity right now except moving it towards zero. We want to add to the velocity whenever we want to move. So whenever the player presses a key to move right, left, up, or down, that is when we would add or subtract to the velocity vector. So we're going to make four helper functions and I believe after that this entire class will be done. Okay, So we're almost there. This last part is pretty simple. Underneath the apply gravity function we will make these helper functions. The first one I'm going to make will be called protected void move right. We'll call this function whenever we want to move the character to the right. And here we'll say velocity.x plus equals a cell plus d cell. So this equation will apply acceleration to the velocity. We're adding deceleration here to compensate for the fact that we're tending towards zero up here. Okay? Let's go down here. And if velocity.x is greater than max speed, we want to cap our velocity at max speed. Because remember, we will never go faster than that max speed variable. Finally, we will want to set the direction that our character is looking at. Because we're moving right, we want to have a variable here that signifies what direction we're looking at. This is helpful later on when you're doing AI detection. Sometimes you want to see if the character is looking to the left or to the right, we'll have a direction vector that stores that information. So really fast, let's go back to gameobject.cs and scroll up to the top. I think it's a good idea that all game objects have a direction vector. Uh, so let's say protected vector2 direction equals new vector2 1 0 so here we are defaulting the direction for every game object in our game to be looking to the right. So if the x-axis is positive 1, that means right. Negative 1, that means left. For the y-axis, if it's positive 1, that means we're looking down. If it's negative 1, that means we're looking up. So let's go back to character.cs, and here we will say direction.x equals 1. And then from here on out, we can just copy this function and paste it a bunch of times and just change the variables, okay? So instead of move right, this next one can be move left. We will subtract here on the velocity.x instead of adding because we're moving to the left. If velocity.x is less than negative max speed, because remember now we're moving in the negative direction, we will say velocity.x equals negative max speed and then direction.x can be negative one now we can copy and paste both of these functions to do the down and up versions. First one we'll call move down. We will say velocity.y plus equals the acceleration. If velocity.y is greater than the max speed, velocity.y equals max speed. And then direction.y should be positive 1. Here we'll say move up. Same thing. Instead of x, we'll say velocity.y minus equals the acceleration. Velocity.y is less than equal to the negative max speed. Velocity.y will equal the negative max speed. And then finally, direction.y equals negative 1. All right, so nothing too crazy. Basically copying and pasting the same functionality and then changing it to be x or y 
depending on the direction. So I now believe the character class is done. I know that was information overload. Um, I actually think this might be the hardest video in the whole series because we're, we're handling a lot of stuff in this class. But the good news is we will reuse this for every other game object and character in our series. So we're saving ourselves a lot of work by structuring things this way and I think it's going to get a little more easier from here on out because we've done all the heavy lifting in these first couple of videos. So now that we have this character class written, we need to actually plug it in. So let's go back to player.cs. Player is a character, so instead of inheriting from game object, we'll inherit from character. And since character inherits from game object, we'll get all the information from game object as well. Let's go down to where we are doing the position input stuff here. So now instead of adding directly to the position, we will call those new functions that we wrote. So we'll say move right. And then to move left, we'll say move left. To move down, we'll say move down. And then to move up, we'll say move up. Let's go ahead and press F5 and see what happens in our game. All right. Yeah. We're moving and notice that we're moving a lot more smoothly. There's a little bit of deceleration and acceleration going on, so f things feel a lot more nicer. And let's see if we can, yep, collisions are still working. Everything's working good. So technically, we could start making our Pong game because look, we're moving like this. That's basically how the Pong paddles move. But let's go ahead and I'd like to take care of the other case of implementing the gravity to show you how it would look if we were making a platformer. All right, so let's exit out and in the character.cs class, let's change apply gravity to true and then restart the program and see what happens. Okay, so <laughs> if you notice, we immediately were dragged down to the floor. So now we're walking on the floor and gravity brought us down. And, <laughs> okay, so the movement's a little weird right now. If you hold down W and then go up and then let go, see gravity's dragging us back down. Um, that's not quite what we would want in a platformer game. We need to be able to jump. You don't walk up in a platformer, right? That doesn't make any sense. We need the W key to be a jump key instead of moving us up. So we need to change things a little bit here. And let's just go ahead and implement a jump function in character.cs that everybody can use to jump. This will be pretty simple. Let's go down to the bottom of the class and underneath move up, I'll make this function. Let's call it protected bool jump and we'll pass in the map. First things first, if we are already jumping, so if jumping equals true, we want to return because we're not programming a double jump. Oh, and specifically, we'll return false. Next, we need to determine that we're standing. So if velocity.y equals zero and on ground, passing in the map, does not equal rectangle.empty. If on ground returns a valid rectangle that is not empty, we know that we're standing on the ground currently. And if we're standing on the ground, that means we're able to jump. So, curly bracket, we will say velocity.y minus equals jump velocity. Oops, capital Y there semicolon. Then we'll set jumping to true and we will return true from this function. If we did not return true, we need to return false here at the end of the function so Visual Studio is happy. So now that we have a function that lets us jump, we can actually call this. Um, and if it's not clear what this is doing, basically we defined a jump velocity variable that's like 16f so whenever we call jump to jump, we're going to move up in the air 
by 16, and then gravity will take us back down. All right, so this is a very basic way of implementing jump. Depending on what type of game you're making, maybe you don't like this, okay, but I think this is simple enough for our case, and it works. So let's go back to player.cs, and inside of the check input function, I'm going to change some things up here. I'm going to say if character, capital C, dot apply gravity, remember earlier we defined that variable to be static, so that's why we're able to easily access it like this. If apply gravity equals false, we will use this control scheme here of moving right, left, down, or up. So if you're doing a top-down game uh, where there's no gravity, you could use that control scheme there. Else, if apply gravity is true, we're going to do things a little differently. We're going to copy and paste this first chunk here because we still want to be able to move right or left. But then we're going to handle the W key a little bit differently. So if input dot key pressed keys dot W is true, we will call jump and pass in the map. Oh, and oops, we need to. Okay, we don't currently have access to map because we didn't pass that into our check input function, but that's easily fixable. Let's just copy and paste the parameter list for the update function up here. And then we'll just copy and paste that into the check input. And then when we call check input in the function here, we will just pass in objects and map. Cool. Now we can press F5 and hopefully this works. Let's give it a shot. All right, there we go. We're moving right and then left. The jump, yeah, check that out. Let's try to go underneath here. We can't jump through the box. Go out here, oh. And okay, it looks like there's a bug. So if you didn't catch that, maybe you're noticing this on your version, but if you go underneath this block and you press jump and then walk back out here, you can't jump anymore. And I actually know what the problem is. We forgot to take care of a specific case in the check collisions function. So let's go back there real fast. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. Oh, it's below here. So right here where we are adding on to the future bounding box, this right here works when we're not applying gravity, but we need to take care of a special case when we are applying gravity because we're going to change how we're checking this. Instead of saying velocity.y not equals zero, <clears throat> we're going to say velocity.y not equal to gravity. All right? Because gravity is being applied, so velocity.y will uh, most likely be one, and that's going to throw off all of our calculations. So uh, we can just fix this really easily by saying apply gravity equals false. All right? And then I'm going to copy this whole chunk. and paste it. And then I'm going to change apply gravity equals true and then velocity.y not equal to gravity. Let's press F5 and see if this fixes the issue. All right, jumping. Yep, it did. So we can go underneath here. The problem was the jumping bull was not being set to false so when we initially went under here, it was true because all of our calculations were screwed up and then it never got set to false because it wasn't being resolved. That's, that's my fault, um, but yeah. We now have the physics set up for a platformer and then if we change the apply gravity variable to false, we can have our four-way direction for a more 2D top-down styled game. Whatever type of game we're trying to make, we have the physics basically taken care of. Let's exit out. And I think that's it for today. <laughs> I'm probably going to separate this video into two separate pieces because I feel like this was a lot of information. But like I said earlier, don't worry. Um, I feel like we're taking care of a lot of the heavy lifting early on in this series. And I think things will gradually get easier. And it'll especially be easier for you at the end when you start to make your own games because all of this stuff will be taken care of for you and you can easily adapt all of this game engine code for your own game. So thanks so much for watching. I hope it was informative and I hope to see you all on the next episode.